Good afternoon, church. I hope we are still enjoying our time at this camp meeting. Um, I know that the messages have been, been eye-opening coming from the other speakers. And, you know, I just praise God that he has uh, allowed me to be here. Um, you know, in in hearing your message, Brother Sammy, it's it's really sad what what's going on. And you know, I I agree with you, Brother uh, Allen, that we are the last generation. There's this is it. This is it. But today we're going to talk about the life of Christ in several different aspects, and I'll I'll finish up that message uh, this evening. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our wonderful God in heaven, Lord, we are thankful just to be here today. Father, we thank you for the bread that we have been able to receive. We thank you, O oh God, that you are working in the lives of your people. And we pray as we continue in this world, Father, that you would nourish us, strengthen us with your word. Father, I am but your servant, and I pray, Lord God, that I would be set aside and that you may be lifted up. Father, be with me as I present this message. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Brother Sammy was talking about an, an unfortunate situation where a brother was burning the books of Ellen White and to hear that really saddens me because I don't know about you, but I believe that Sister White is the prophet for our days. Do you believe that? Amen. You know, there's times when people ask me, you know, why do you use so much of the spirit of prophecy? And, you know, my response is, you know, either she's a prophet or she's not, right? We know that God is no respecter of persons. So I look at Sister Wright's white writings just as I do Isaiah or Jeremiah, right? Either she's inspired or she's not. There is no in-between, right? You know, there's others who say, well, you know, Sister White said we should always go to the Bible. And of course, I agree. But let us not forget, just because someone humbles themselves doesn't mean that they're not at the level that God has placed them, right? It was John the Baptist who denied being Elijah when Christ said what? If you would have him, he is the Elijah, right? It was Jesus who said, why callest thou me good? There is but one good, but God. But wouldn't we all agree that Jesus is good? Amen. So just because someone humbles themselves doesn't mean they are not exalted. Amen. I want to begin in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, we see how Christ humbles himself. Verse 5, 6, and 7, and this is how it reads. Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, what? thought it not robbery to be equal with God, right? 
I like the way the revised version says it. So I'm going to read it. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be on equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. He didn't think it was a thing to be grasped to be on equality with his father. Yet he was. And being that he was equal with his father, he humbled himself as a man, right? Now, when we talk about the life of Christ, actually, let me say this. So I've always been asked this question, being a non-Trinitarian coming from a Trinitarian. If Jesus is who you say he is, how is it that there's a quote that says, original, unborrowed, underived, right? Let's talk about the life of Christ. Let's go to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 to 4. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was what? Life. And the life was the light of men. Let me first ask you this question. Is there any difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man outside of nature? Yes or no? No. Right? Here's what Ephesians says. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Right? I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy on the vocation wherewith you, ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering for bearing one another in love. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now notice what it says. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is what? The same also that ascended. Who is it that ascended into the heavens? Christ. Right? And as he comes back, he calls himself the son of what? The Son of God and the Son of Man, right? In the first volume of the Spirit of Prophecy, I want you to notice what it says regarding Christ. Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 17, paragraph 1. The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself. We're going to talk now, about how Christ is original. 
What does original mean? One of a kind. There's none like him. Amen? The son was seated on the throne with the father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself. Did anyone else share this equality? No. So that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. The word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father. His son had he invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Right? Christ was original. In John chapter 5, let's read verse 18 to 23. John chapter 5 verse 18 says this, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself what? Equal with God. Verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do what? Nothing of himself, but what he seeth who? The father do. For what thing soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Right? In Proverbs chapter 8, we're going to go to verse 22. Right? We've all have, have experience with these verses. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, no heights, where, the, where there were no depths, I was brought forth, where there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was what? There. When he set a compass upon the face of the depths, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the, to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Whatsoever the sun saw, that's what he did, right? He learned by the side of his father. Although the son created, he gave all credit to who? The father. Continuing in John chapter 5, verse 20, it says, For the father loveth the son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son. Right? For as the Father, so the Son. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the, the Son, even as they honor who? The Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to hath life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Was Christ original? Yes. He was original. There was none like him. 
All that he had was given to him by who? The Father. And it was these things that Lucifer was seeking to have to himself. Right? Notice this. In the Great Controversy, 1888 version, 493, paragraph 1. Notice what it says. He was unique, wasn't he? Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being, the what? Only being in all the universe that could enter in to all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ, the Father wrought in the creation of all heavenly beings. Amen? Now, listen to what Satan's controversy was. In the first volume of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 18, we'll begin at paragraph 2. It says this, there was contention among the angels. Satan and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They were discontented and unhappy because they could not look into his unsearchable wisdom and ascertain his purposes in exalting his son, Jesus, and endowing him with such unlimited power and command, they rebelled against the authority of the Son. Now, understand, there was a war in heaven, right? What was that war over? The Sonship of Christ, right? 25 letters in manuscripts, manuscript 86, 1910, paragraph 28, 29, says this. Well, Lucifer, he was striving. He had glory in the heavenly courts, but he was striving for Christ's place next to God. Next, he wanted to be God, but he could not obtain that. Christ was the only begotten Son of God, and Lucifer, that glorious angel, got up a warfare over the matter until he had to be thrust down to the earth. Right? We know that Christ, the life that he had, was very unique. It was the life of the Father that was in the Son. Am I correct? It was this life, this position, this power that Lucifer coveted. Am I correct? He was original. Now let's explore that second term, unborrowed. What does it mean to borrow something? You've got to give it back, right? Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read verse 8 to 12. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, he says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment, 
and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall what? Shall not fail. Signs of the Times, April 8th, 1897, paragraph 2. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. It is not physical life that is here specified but immortality, the life which is exclusively the power of God. The word who was with God and who was God had this life. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ is unborrowed. This life is not inherent in man. Why is that? Exactly. Man's life is borrowed. Which brings us to our next point. The life of Christ was underived. Right? What does that mean? Notice how life's man or man's life is derived. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. Says what? For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. We already know that the Sabbath is the day of rest, the day we come together and meet with God. But what are we meeting for from one moon, from one moon to another? What is that meeting for? To eat of the tree of life. Right? Because man's life is derived. Ellen White has a vision where she sees the tree of life and a river flowing through the midst of the tree, one trunk of the tree on one side and a trunk of a tree on the other side. And they're joined at the top in one tree. This tree provides life for man, right? It was a necessity for man to eat of the tree of life before the fall. And it'll be so after the fall. Amen? In Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, 2, and verse 14. All of this has symbolism, right? Revelation is a very symbolic book. And although... Man will inherit eternal life. There's still the symbol of where man's life is derived from, right? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing 
of the nation. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to what? The tree of life. And may enter in through the gates into the city. Does Christ have to partake of a tree of life? Exactly. He doesn't have to take of life because he gives it. He is a source of life himself. However, our life is derived. Is that the same for every life? That's in existence? Of course it is. Early writings, page 39, paragraph 3. Early writings, page 39, paragraph 3. Notice what is said here. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Wings were given me, and an angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. The grass of the place was living green, and the birds there warbled a sweet song. The inhabitants of the place were of all sizes. They were noble, majestic, and lovely. They bore the express image of who? Jesus. And their countenance beamed with holy joy, expressive of the freedom and happiness of that place. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. The reply was, we have lived in strict obedience to the commandments of God and have not fallen by disobedience like those on the earth. Then I saw what? Two trees. One looked much like what? The tree of life in the city. The fruit of both looked beautiful but of one they could not eat. They had the power to eat of both, but were forbidden to eat of one. Is the life of this world derived? Absolutely. Then my attending angel said to me, none in this place have tasted of the forbidden tree, but if they should eat, what would happen? They would fall. And to fall would mean what? Sin. And sin produces death. It is only the father and the son that have life in themselves. Right. So the understanding of the phrase original, unborrowed, and underived is clear. However, that view presents a problem for the Trinitarian. Right? The view that Christ Original, unborrowed, underived means anything other than this brings a problem with the death of Christ. There are several people who have said to me, just like you, uh, brother, mentioned, Christ didn't die because God can't die. 
But the question is, how do we answer that? The answer is simple. All that Christ had was given to him. Right? Even the life that was in himself. So if it was given to him, could he voluntarily give it back? Absolutely. But the life that was in God, who gave it to him? No one. <laughs> no one. Unless we have a clear understanding of who Christ is, unless we understand him as the only begotten Son of God, who received everything of the Father, how can we even comprehend what the Word of God is telling us? That's why so many doctrines seem in confusion. The confusion is simply a lack of understanding. How many of us know that Christ died? Amen? Sister White says all that comprise the life of Christ slept in the tomb. He died the death of a sinner. Amen. Let's go back to John chapter 1 and verse 1. Because this verse is used very heavily in connection with the quote, original, unborrowed, under I. But let's see what it's really saying here. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Let me ask you this. Why doesn't the verse read, in the beginning was God? Amen. Simple. Because God had no beginning. What does the very word beginning mean? A starting point, right? So the text is actually saying it all started with who? Jesus. The Bible is pretty simple. We're the ones who complicate it. It all started with Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Right? However, if you understand God as a title, it all makes sense. If you understand God as a title of authority, it all makes sense. And I know, I know there are times in the Bible when it's used seemingly as a name instead of a title. But that's when we compare Scripture with Scripture, right? It all started with Jesus, and Jesus was with the Father, and Jesus was as the Father. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was You know, as, as we get closer to the end, error is going to get a little bit more difficult to discern from truth. But the only way we're going to prevail and know is if we stick to two sources. What are those? The word of God and the spirit of prophecy. 
right? To the law and to the prophets. This is our only hope. Because we have an enemy that is ruthless. He's vicious. He desires us to throw away the spirit of prophecy. He desires us to throw away the word of God. I believe, uh, just as Brother Allen was saying, that not only Ellen White, but the pioneers, they all came together to present truth to us. And if we don't stand on the platform of truth, brothers, we are lost. Forsake the guide and lose your way. Right? Understanding the life of Christ is also important in understanding the death of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, Lord, once again, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we can't imagine how difficult it must have been to make such a sacrifice. But in that sacrifice, your love is put on full display for the world, the universe to see. Father, we thank you that we can avail ourselves of it. We can put ourselves in the way of salvation because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Father, it's our desire to be in harmony with you, to be in the truth, not just received in the mind, but also received in the heart lived out in the life. Father, help us where we can't help ourselves. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.